I am the school and special services librarian, so it was a brand new position created when I got hired, which was really exciting. And background on me, my aunt was actually born with severe brain damage, and so back in that time there was only, there wasn't a Misericordia or Lamb's Farm, it was basically institutions. So my grandma and the neurologist actually created a facility in Arkansas, of all places, it was cheap to buy land at that time, <laughs> um, of a house, and it has full-time nurse care, and they do programs, and they have courses, and they have pool therapy, so she lived there from when she was 10, 12 years old onward, and she would come home periodically. And so I grew up around that and helping out the facility, which was really great, so that's the background. And then I was really invested, obviously, when the position came open, and then I was really gung-ho at the start of like doing programs and helping all our families and then there was just a missing piece of the library and the policy side and so when we had the amazing speaker at um, Harold Washington Library about two years ago when she did the ADA coordinator program it was really interesting to me because I already do we're really lucky at Northbrook I can do any programs that I want for our families I talk to all our families on what they want but it was the staff side that was missing mm -hmm. the youth services side was totally covered you're we totally comfortable with any ability um, but the rest of the library wasn't so that was where it was lacking so I was interested in getting into the law side and I actually um, had an undergrad in business so law and heavy tax work was really interesting to me <laughs> um, so in Cook County alone this is an older statistic um, but 10.4% of Cook County has some form of dis a disability, which is really interesting to me. So after all of my training and doing the program, we actually did ADA staff training with the entire library, and so this was one of the slides we did, and everyone was really shocked. So even though you don't see someone that you think has a disability come in the library, guaranteed someone, someone does every single day. So pop quiz. Um, who knows what the five titles of the ADA are? <laughs> One, two, three, four, and five. What do you mean? Five titles. So there are five titles. Um, what do we think the library is a title in the ADA? Uh, One, two, public, three, four, five. Or civic or something. So uh, Americans with Disabilities. <laughs> sure. Sorry. No, the Americans with Disability Act. Um, it separates all these different titles. So you work within your title essentially. So everyone has Title I because everyone has employment, so you're employed at your library, so there's Title I. Title II is a library and government public entity, so as a library we function as Title II entity, so we have to focus on those laws that incorporate Title II. Title III are public accommodations and local businesses. Title IV is telecommunications and relay services, and Title V is like, and it doesn't fit in that, and sometimes <laughs> transportation. For some odd reason, transportation falls on miscellaneous. Um, so these are the five titles. So initially I knew nothing really essentially about the ADA, like the hardcore law of it, besides that it was a great movement and ADA is really important and everyone, everyone has to be ADA compliant in their buildings, but the great thing about ADA coordinator positions is you really get invested in the nitty gritty of the law and how you can actually make changes in your library, so Title II is really exciting. So, fun question. This is really hot topic now in the ADA community. Mm -hmm. Does the law require your social media content to be accessible? Does the law require it? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. No. <laughs> it does not. So, as of right now, it does not. So, um, Title II functions under Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. So, there are web content accessibility guidelines. It does not touch on social media at all, if you saw in the media. Domino's was actually sued by mm -hmm. someone who couldn't access the mobile app because they were blind and they won their case. So Domino said there are no laws governing this, but the Supreme Court said doesn't matter, they win. So this is okay. going to become more and more apparent um, in our day-to-day -day lives with every business you see. Um, having, even though there's no law right now, um, you can still be sued and lose for not having mobile access or accessibility for social media. So Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, there are no rules as of now, but it doesn't mean you still can't face a lawsuit, basically. So, one other question. Does every library have an ADA coordinator? No. I think no, but legally, if you have 50 people, you have an ADA coordinator, but they are typically 
the executive director or the assistant director. And so when a grievance becomes apparent in your library and someone files a grievance, it, in your handbook it's typically the executive director or assistant director that takes that on and has to really follow that law. But also, ADA coordinators are in every big government. So your village hall has an ADA coordinator. Whether you've known them or know who they are or not, you have one. And so I have been certified as an ADA coordinator. So basically, I'm like the backup. I know more law than the associate, the executive director does, the assistant director does. Will I handle the grievance procedure? Probably not, but I can back them up on the actual law of it. So it's an interesting thing to go through if you don't it's a really big undertaking, but any of this information is still relevant to you if you don't even go through with the ADA coordinator position. So this is one of the slides we talk about um, in our staff training because all of you are here in the snails world. You might understand all of these things that are wrong with this picture, but the person in circulation might not understand. The person that's working reference stuff might not even understand, like, this is really wrong to me in my eyes. So it's just important to educate all staff, even though you're not doing programming, you're not um, planning events or policies or things. But who can tell me like top two things that are wrong with this image? There's no railing. There's no railing, yes. Anything else? It just looks so unsafe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so unsafe. So if you notice that uh, their power wheelchair is like barely making the wow. the slats. Yeah. So if you had a manual wheelchair, that might not be the case either. And the, the incline is so steep. Yeah. This there's no way this is a ADA. You're go, you're going down, you're going down fast. <laughs> so then people see this image and they're like, well this doesn't this doesn't seem right either though. Um, but it does. So this is the way that all kind of ADA architecture and building is moving. So it's it's fully accessible by everyone. So there's a railing, there's a ramp, there's stairs. So no matter how you want to access the space, you can. You have a stroller, a wheelchair, um, heavy bags, a push cart, a walker. Anybody can access the space no matter if they have a disability or not. So universal design. Everyone talks about it in their library remodels, but it's the largest thing I talk about at ADA conferences is universal design. Not focusing on disability, but focusing on everyone being able to access the space. So instead of like an electric ramp, which people don't know how to use, you have a ramp that's like this that has different axes of ramp. Um, so instead of like heavy machinery that lifts people up or different ramps, people are trying to move to more integrated architecture designs. So the whole reason I got interested in the ADA program was this is our auditorium seating, and this is our most highly requested thing out of all ADA requests at the library. We are fortunate to have basically a movie theater style auditorium. It seats 220 people, and we have 14 ADA seats, and we also show Oscar movies before they come out on DVD. So Every single seat gets filled up with 220 people, and then there's a wait list of people. And every single time, these seats are highly sought out, they're claimed, and it was really hard to understand how people are going to register these requests, how people are going to ask questions, what they should and shouldn't ask, just basic customer service. So this is the whole reason why I got behind it. So these four seats are our additional seats. They have swing-out arms, so they are considered under the ADA to be accessible, but the, the squares are wheelchair spaces, and then the seats can also be taken out. So it's kind of like this fluid space that you didn't know, like, the law of, like, how, how can you take a seat out? What hours can you take a seat out? It was all these complicated things that I was interested in that I wanted the law behind it before I could really give any um, recommendations to the space. So the ACTCP program is the ADA program, and this is kind of like the breakdown. Um, so it's definitely a financial investment for your library, but you do take away so much that um, most people don't have in a library setting. So to register to be in the ACTCP program is $300, and their ADA symposiums are $750 just for the registration, so it's expensive. Um, 
the majority of people that you will find that go to them are lawmakers, village officials, architecture people, construction people, and then there was three librarians there last year with me and two other people. So uh, <laughs> it's a, if you don't do the program at all, I highly recommend just looking into going to the symposium. You get so much out of it in three days that you talk with other people, you get the background of different, I don't know how, like, how to put a shower in, what the distance of a shower and a door are, the toilet, yeah. things you never thought you needed to know in life. But, um, there's different requirements for the program that I had to do that you, you don't have to do at all if there's different things that interest you. There's so much on the workplace, on hidden disabilities, on Title II, on libraries. They're doing more education ones now, which is great. So they noticed that more teachers and college professors and librarians are coming, so they're catering more to that, so they have more sessions that talk about those things. So then there was a renewal fee, and then 40 credits needed to take the exam. The exam is 80 questions. You can only get 10 wrong to pass, um, and it took me four and a half hours. <laughs> and they're very, it's a very detailed test. Um, it's not, it's open book, don't worry. It's open book, and there's no way you would know every answer just off the bat. It's, you have to go through um, chapters and chapters of different laws to make sure that you're getting the right one. But in the end, I passed. Congratulations. <laughs> so this is just uh, a glimpse of what the program looks like. When I started, I didn't really know all the things you needed. So you need 40 credits, so everyone takes the foundation level credits, what's the role of the ADA coordinator, self-evaluation and transition plans, that's really interesting because every village has to have one, like Parks and Rec, and how we're going to transition from all the things that are not um, ADA compliant. 2010 standards for accessible design, this is number one, the most thing everybody should look at if they're doing a redesign for their library. This talks about the doors, the weight of the doors, um, different spaces, how tables are lined up, and just basically everything from like meeting rooms and program policies too, um, and then Title I guidelines. So you take all those, and then effective communication is so interesting. So it's like how you can make the program the most effective communication-wise as possible. It mostly applies to village meetings, but it can apply to everything that you see here can go to library stuff. So even though you're talking about the village, there's different information you take away from each and every thing. Reasonable accommodation is really nice to learn about because every program you can do reasonable accommodations for. Emergency preparedness is interesting for, you know, emergencies. And public rights away is really interesting if you have parking lot issues in your in your lot. So all these things might seem overwhelming, but you can pick and choose what you want or do none of it at all. But this is just an overview of what it is. And then you have electives. So the majority of the credits you get are from going to the symposium. So I went to one symposium for three days and I got half of what I needed. So that's probably why it's more expensive because you get so much out of it. And so I went to two and I had almost everything done. Because um, a lot of these things are not offered online. Some of them are, but not all of them. And then other ones I did through like ALA learning programs or from um, Holly's different webinars that she offers. And I submitted those and those count for electives. So be overwhelmed by how much you have to submit, but a lot of it counts. So think like snails, things that we do, webinars, things you go to for disabilities counts. So that's nice too. So these are just a couple of conference session examples. So again, if you don't have to pursue ADA coordinatorship at all, but these are just really interesting things that I attended. So environment since we age, it was talking about different um, colors and textures in a room and how people access the space differently with disabilities and if you have cataracts or if you're aging or if you have Alzheimer's. So it's a really hot topic now in architecture and design. So like this wall and this padding kind of blends more with the carpet sometimes. And so if you have lack of depth perception, it's going to be hard to find your space in the room. So things like that. Accessible social media was the most well attended thing in the entire conference. People were waiting outside in the doors. They had to open up the doors and she had to use a really loud microphone just because everyone has social media no matter what company or library you have it. And unfortunately there's no laws right now, but the the consensus was in the next two to three years there's going to be tons and tons of lawsuits. Um, so it's important to make sure that your social media is accessible as possible because 
whether libraries are going to get sued or not, but companies will. Domino's already has, so it's on the horizon. Everyone's on the lookout for it. Service animals, everyone has them from the library. They're fantastic. Miniature horses and dogs. But everyone doesn't really know what the questions to ask, you know, the specific law. Also, that one is the most well attended too because everyone has a public space and everyone has animals that can come kind of walk into it. So that's always the thing to look out for because it also can be a lawsuit. <laughs> um, universal design, again, architecture. And then beyond compliance, so incorporating disability into the fabric of your institution, beyond customer service, what can you do to make your policy and people that you're onboarding um, incorporated into everything that you have to offer in your library? So beyond, every, your library is 100% ADA compliant, most likely they've been cleared by the construction workers, the architects, but it doesn't mean that you can't be more compliant. There's all, you can always go above and beyond. The law always designates like the bare minimum. So the ADA guidelines are the basics, but you can always go above and beyond and you will still be compliant even though if you go the extra mile. So why? You might be like, this is a lot of information, Sarah. This is a lot you to do. It took me two and a half years, but it creates a point person for staff questions and projects. So we're going through a remodel right now. People are doing different ideas and brainstorming how we access the lobby. We have different meetings. We have lots of programs that fill up. How do we make those spaces accessible? Um, administration doesn't know that. So having someone that anybody in the department or anybody in the library can go to and just ask an informal question on what are the measurements you have to do for like space between chairs and just simple questions like that. Providing ADA guidance and compliance. So. We just made a maker space. We have ginormous glass doors. They're extremely heavy. Um, why didn't we have an, a, a button that opened the glass doors? You know, things like that you might not have noticed unless you um, took one of the architecture sessions or you looked more into the law heavily. So while it's ADA compliant, it doesn't mean that it's fully accessible. Helps staff feel more comfortable serving patrons of all abilities. Shannon mentioned the waiting for the response. Absolutely nobody, when I did the ADA training, realized that, and they were answering questions for people that they felt uncomfortable because they were doing that awkward waiting time. But delay of just standing there and waiting for someone to have that processing time is so important. So just having staff training um, and telling people that they can feel more comfortable and get them the more um, just comfortable around everybody with all abilities, because while we all work with people of all abilities, every department might not. Ability to have input on policy changes. So it's kind of nice when you have a title behind you, you have um, more power to understand the law and you can actually make the changes. Well, if I didn't have it, I'm not necessarily be able to make those policy changes, but we're updating our, um, our handbook, and so I have full ability to make input on our ADA compliance and grievance procedure because I understand more of the law now than other people might not have. So if you want to make those changes, it's kind of nice when you have that background. So what now? I provided ADA staff training on policies on how we can do that registration for that auditorium and how the best customer service way to do that is. Um, work with management on design and policy changes, so now we're looking into getting an automatic door button, which is great. Um, and I know people to contact to help me with that. And you serve as a backup ADA coordinator for the library, which is also nice. But you also don't need to have that to attend the symposium. You don't need to be pursuing anything to go to the symposium. It's just a great resource to go to and learn all the information. So what can you do? If you don't pursue this at all, it's totally fine, but there's great resources that I've found to help you all. So your ADA center, our local ADA center, is the Great Lakes ADA center. I talk with Jason sometimes, he's fantastic. Um, <laughs> he gets back to me really quickly. So the law is extensive. There's no way that anybody, even an ADA quarter, knows the law back and forth. It's, there's just too much, it's always changing. So we had an issue of a space bigger than this, and we had a large, um, program coming in and we wanted to know if we should save seats in the front for wheelchair spaces so people could have an easier way to access the space. So I asked Jason and he actually showed me all the different um, laws on programs and meetings and he actually told me that's not the way to do it. That, that takes away freedom of choice and so you want to have the most freedom of choice when you're attending any program but 
You might not have known that. You might not have been able to dig through all the different laws to find that. But he gets back to you, not just him, there's other people in the office. <laughs> but he's great. Um, they'll get back to you with any question you have about a program or how to make it accessible on what you actually need to do with, within a week. And I couldn't access the email they had given me, so I called them, called me back a minute later, emailed me. So they're really great about responding, which is awesome. The ADA symposium is May 10th to 13th in Kansas City, Missouri. So a closer one last time was in Texas. So it's a nice, Missouri's not going to be great, but at least it's quick. <laughs> um, and then if you are ever curious, there's tons of information on the 2010 ADA standards for accessible design. And that can be found at ada.gov. So that's typically what everybody focuses on um, for design. So if you're looking at a remodel, or you're looking at changing a space around, um, take a look. They separate it out into chapters, kind of just like overwhelmed with this big law book. Correct. There's nothing newer? No. So, <laughs> I mean, because looking at this, it's like we're going to be 2020. So, this is 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, let's look at the standards for yeah. 10 years ago. So, and we're going them slowly. Okay. <laughs> <That> is, <laughs> especially ADA laws. So, architecture wise, most buildings don't have to even be fully up to 2010 yet. So, there are some like Think about the, the East Coast, like brick mortar buildings like that were built ages and ages ago. They are still trying to get up to code for 2010. So we are still working on that. It's, and then social media. Now that wasn't really as prevalent in 2010 as it is now. So um, they're working on it. Of course, court cases kind of push that law forward to make it more happen if there's more and more lawsuits. And then if you're ever curious, the ASGCLA, which is a, a section of a, ALA, um, they had this great webinar class, like an e-learning class. This was last year, but I think she will offer it again. So keep an eye out. They also have different webinars you can attend to, but building an accessible, inclusive library community, community with Carly Spina, and she was great. You can ask her any questions, and one of the final like projects that you do is create a program and they can give you um, any feedback you wanted, and she was fantastic at it. And then check your library policies and registration processes. Is it as easy as it can be for someone with disabilities to register? We found that we have a center on deafness, and they weren't coming to our programs because it was just too hard. They didn't think that they could request reasonable accommodations. They didn't think they were, could request an interpreter when they could. So does your community and um, community partners know that you can make accommodations? Most libraries have a fund. It's not coming out of your program budget line. They have an admin fund that can pay for a communicator, a sign language. They can pay for a person to type out the whole program. It's called a cart. Um, type out the whole program as you're doing it. So just because you might feel limited in your own budget doesn't mean your library cannot accommodate. So what can you do to make accommodations easier? Um, take a look. So we did a whole list of things for people that had no idea how to make their programs more accessible. So we do Google Slides. So every presenter has to do Google Slides and we do Google Speaker. Is it 100% effective? Not yet. Um, people giggle at the Google Trans the Google Live. So basically underneath it, it tells you what you're actually saying. People will read it, but they don't actually need to read it, and they will laugh at different words that you say that are not those words. But it's making it accessible for someone that maybe cannot hear me as clearly, or just likes to read it more. I like to read things more than listen to people sometimes, too. We do printouts, at least one to two printouts, of presentation programs, which is helpful if you need an actual handout. We print out 50 for everybody, no, but we can make copies, but having those just on hand. Always using a microphone when we have programs. And then having maintenance on hand if we need to change chairs around, which is always helpful to know where they are and when they are. So just easy, simple things you might not have thought of that can make a space more accessible just outright instead of having to change on the fly when someone comes in and needs a different accommodation. What did you say that was again? Google Slides and... Google Live Transcribe. So it's Google on... Google Live Transcribe. Yeah, it's on... Um, so it's down here. So it's under captions, so you can turn on captions. And then if it has the microphone on the computer, that's the big thing. So then you can read. Eventually they will, I feel like, make the text larger. But right now, I mean this is the best that they have out right now. And then captions for YouTube clips, people don't do this. 
in their presentations or their programs, but it's just an easy thing to click. Um, and then print out presentation slides using a microphone, all these things. And then if you have a summer reading video that you have, um, YouTube dictates its its own like transcription of what you're saying. It's not always 100% clear. They also don't do uh, periods, commas, you know, they don't do that. So you have to enter it in yourself. It's very quick, it's very easy. YouTube makes it the easiest out of anybody. Facebook does not do that. So if you're doing a Facebook Live, it will not do transcriptions as of yet. Um, <coughs> and then if you're doing Instagram posts, make sure you're doing alt text, all these different things. They can be very overwhelming at first. It's actually easier to take it bit by bit and piece by piece. So I will share this with the whole um, snails email group. But this is a really great training video. It's about 20 minutes from the ADA, and it's all about customer service. And everyone from different abilities talks about how they interact with different restaurants and libraries and businesses and how they're treated and how we can work more to be more inclusive, which is great. So we showed that at the training, too. And then accessibilityonline.org slash ADA tech. ADA has realized the need for more tech webinars for everybody, so they are doing bi-monthly, monthly, depends on ADA sometimes, um, but they are doing webinars on different forms of technology, like social media, and making our website more accessible. So if you're interested or your admin's more interested in that, that's a really good one to attend. Mm -hmm. That's it. So are there any questions? There's a lot of information, but anyone has like questions? <laughs> I just want to say thank you for doing this mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. my husband is an amputee and people don't like when I whenever I start at live they're like, oh yeah, ADA compliant. I'm like, no no no, you guys this is a big deal. Because I have, we have gone places where we can't get out. Oh like, sure. I mean, I'll never forget way to Ravinia and he didn't have his prosthetic, he was on crutches. And we had to leave early, and we could not get out of the theater. I mean, like, we could not get out. I had to, like, stand in front of him and be like, excuse me, you're going to have to move. I have to. It was awful. Yeah. So it does happen, and it does happen. And, like, he'll go to a hotel he travels, and he's sure. like, do you have a shower chair? And they'll be like, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have one. And he had, one time he had to go and buy one oh. just to stay at a hotel. Like, it's, there are things that you don't realize, and I didn't even realize until oh, we, sure. like, I'm always like, oh, right, you have a leg. I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, yeah. it's like, it's so I, I just appreciate that you're doing this. So, oh, yeah. And everyone's like, great, you go fine. It's like, that's not the best you can be, though. Like, the law is the bare minimum of what it should be. Because if they ask for more, that just wouldn't happen. And while places like don't have funding can't get to the extreme code that we would all love for everything to be. So, unfortunately, a lot of things are dated and they're not accessible for everybody. But that's the law that we have right now. Um, so it is nice to be able to make those changes and be like, we can do more. You're allowed to do more. You're, you're, you should do more. Um, yeah. yeah. That explains why, too, with some of the remodels of businesses or libraries. And I think it's a brand new remodel. Why is it not more compliant? But if they're looking at laws that are 10 years old, mm -hmm. yeah. and I get the architects are more interested in the aesthetics. They want it to all look mm -hmm. in a certain way, and they're not about accessibility. Yeah, and even like programs, they're the one that Jason said, he's great. <laughs> um, so for big meetings like this, you have to have a 61 diameter, so not diameter? Math. Um, a 61 inch at least space where you can fully turn in your wheelchair. Does every space have that if you're fully packed and you have everybody in there? No. Um, so even though your building is compliant, you might not actually be complying with the different programs that you're offering for everybody. So mm -hmm. that extra thing that people don't even know, I had no idea that different meetings had like different diameters and places you had to have chairs and you had to have more space for wheelchairs at different places. Because you just think the space is ADA compliant because it was built this way and it's, it, it's not like that. Do you know someone, if you could contact someone from ADA, because we're in the process of planning or remodeling. Mm -hmm. Maybe having a rep from ADA Great Lakes come to the library and just, just talking to you know the administrators and things like that about like hey let's review the plans here's something you didn't think about yeah I, another really overrun that <laughs> they they have a so they Great Lakes serves everybody in the Great Lakes so not just Illinois. Um, but they'd be able to help set you up with somebody, I'm sure. 
because they have such a high resource of people that they work with. So while they might not be able to come, they might have a designer or an architect that can give you feedback on it, I'm sure. You said most villages and towns have an ADA coordinator within them, so that yes. would be the person to mm -hmm. contact first. Yeah, so they might not be the, the expert on architecture, but they can help like different programs, how you make those as accessible as possible, they should able to, but a lot of ADA corners are also so overworked because they are the village and they'll be all doing everything and everything for the ADA, so it is hard to contact them, see what they have to offer. <laughs> I'll share too, I reached out to Jason and he gave me a list of people to contact when yeah. we had a question about remodel or having somebody walk through the physical space of the library. Yeah, he's so, great. Right? He's great. He's <laughs> phenomenal. And he, um, We'll also kind of tell you, you know, I'll say this is the official list, and I'll kind of talk you through um, his recommendations too off the list. You know? Yeah. So where he's seen, you know, he's worked with them directly. And he's so knowledgeable. He was like, well, this is what I would do. Here's the wall, though. I'll send you these documents. And then he, like, gives you his own personal opinion, which is also great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there's no way that anybody can know all the law, but when it's your full-time day job, he has way more resources than any of us could. But... We're librarians, we like more information research, but they like it more, I think. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, Jason, you have a question? Well, thank you guys. Again, I'm looking to that. If you suppose it's going to be